our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted to the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
That's what we're Crazy, crazy, crazy. The scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. You know, I want you to get the concept of what it's about. You've got bad news or devastating circumstances or something like that. And everything about you is wanting to do something and you're wanting to do it yesterday because you want the whole thing to be turned around. And it doesn't seem like there's any hope. It seems like it's just going farther and farther south. It's that time when you need to realize, I need to be still and know that God is God. It's that time when I need to be still and know that God is God. My mind gets into mental turmoil and I'm just going over things and I can't sleep and I can't rest and I'm worried, moving back and forth. And I need to just be able to say, God, help me be still and know that you are God. There is no cares that God is not aware of. Amen. I'm say that again. That was a really weak amen. There are no cares that God is not aware of. Amen. amen. God knows the very number of hairs on your head. How many did you lose this morning in the shower? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> I heard that. That was good. The bottom line is, you're not even as concerned about the hairs on your head as God is concerned about the hairs on your head. Am I right? If God is that concerned over you that he knows the very number of the hairs on your head, he knows what you need even before he, you ask or think. That's what the scripture says. You don't have a care that he's not aware of. So sometimes we say, well, God, why didn't you show up earlier? Because he's waiting for us to be still to recognize that he is God. In that psalmist, it said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High God. When you're going through distress, it's time to run to God. It doesn't matter what kind of distress it is, it's time to run to God. It's time to run to God. If you read a more modern translation of this, it would say when there are earthquakes. I thought that was a pretty good thing about the mountain shaking, calling it earthquakes. A number of years ago, it's been now, not that long ago, but at least uh, five years ago, probably eight years ago, there was an earthquake that came all the way up through Pennsylvania here. My daughter happened to have stopped here at the church for something. She says, Dad, I'm standing on the carport and it's shaking. I said, well, get out of there. <laughs> Isn't that right, Tricia? <laughs> we had an earthquake here. There were people that felt it, people that did it. I can't imagine what it's like to live in California where it shakes like that every day. <laughs> That's not my place to live. But bless those that do live there. Understand? Well, what I want to share is this. You've got to be able to let things go. And it's hard. Amen. You've got to be able to let things go, but it's hard. Because they've jumped on you. They have found you. They've got you chained up. They've got you chained up to the point where you know that you should give glory to God. You know that you should worship God. But God, you don't know the circumstances, and I really don't feel like worshiping you today. There's a power of worshiping God. Amen. You've heard this before, but I'm going to share it again this morning. When I had my photocolectomy with the ileostomy, and they gave me morphine, which wasn't doing anything for the pain, but making me see things that wasn't there, and then I decided that I wasn't taking any more of that because it got real sick, and I was just really, really hurting. And us guys are dumb. We try to be tough. Why are we like that, Bill? I'm not sure. <laughs> so they had come and they'd given me a shot when my doctor was finally contacted, and just like that, I, I felt the pain go. And I said to my wife, you might as well go home. I says, I I'm going to sleep. I, I said, I know I am. I've been awake a long time. And I slept. And I woke up, and the, the nurse had told me that the, need more than I should ask, but you wake up and you try to be tough. You wake up because you hurt a little bit, and you try to tough it out. It's not the brightest thing in the world. But I'm hurting a little bit more and a little bit more, and I 
of a sudden, God, I I'm hurting. Should I ask for that? What should I do? And I know that the Lord immediately told me I should start just giving him some praise and glory. So I raise up my hands and I'm giving glory to God and praise to God and stuff. And I did that about 15 minutes and, uh, and I was still hurting and I'm thinking about pushing a little butter in the call the nurse and the guy beside me in the other bed, he says, what do you call that? I never got to see his face. We were all separated by that curtain. He says, what do you call that? I said, I call that praising God. He said, would you do it again? He says, it's making me feel better. <laughs> you see, too often we're too focused on just us. Amen. I just pray to God for who he is. I can praise to God for the things that he has already done for me. I can praise to God for the glories that he has brought into my life. I can praise to God so it will be an encouragement to those around us. We've got to give God praise in that situation. Why do we get sidetracked? Because we get so focused on just us. It says, be still and know that I am God. It's not about my desires, my wishes, my wants. It's about recognizing Him. This all started off in the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter. God told Moses to take the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Most of you know the story. The first Passover was, the death angel came through, and the Pharaoh said to them, leave, and they left. But instead of growing on the straight route and on the easy route, they went the hard way. Isn't it interesting how God takes us the hard way sometimes? When I first came here to Tunkhannock, I'd stop over at the school every once in a while just to see what kids were doing. And one of the boys that was in church at that time, he was a freshman here. I, I got over there and the, where the side hill is, right there that goes up to where the water thing is. He's there and he's running up there like a fool and then walking back down. And then running up there like a fool and walking back down. And I said to him, what on earth are you doing? He says, I'm warming up for baseball. He says, anybody can run on a flat. He says, but if you're going to push yourself to be good, you've got to take the hard places. Most of you already knew that. How good do you want to be for Almighty God? Good enough to say, God, I'm willing for you to take me through the hard places. You mature faster. You grow bigger. You get stronger as you go through those hard places. But you've got to be willing to say, take us there. And he takes them south to where they're in mountains. And the Red Sea is in front of them. And Pharaoh changes his mind and sends an army behind him. And they look at Moses and say, we figured this would happen. There weren't enough graves there in Egypt. Now we're all going to be buried out here in the wilderness. And Moses said, just be still. Just be still. It goes like this in verse 13. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Hallelujah. He said, Just be still and watch what God is about to do. Just be still and watch what God is about to do. The hardest part of the battle wasn't what God was going to do. The hardest part of the battle was for them to control themselves to be still. How about your battles? Is the hardest part for you to get a hold of yourself with the help of God to be still? Or are you still ready to rant and rant? You see, this is the whole test in the book of Job. Job was going through great trials. God already knew what the end product would be. And it would be victorious. But God, Job couldn't look at the end product. He could only look at the right now and say, Where are you? <laughs> that was cute. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes it looks like conflict 
times it looks like conflict and it looks like hopelessness. But the Lord will fight for you. Hallelujah. And you've got to say, Lord, help me to hold my peace. Help me to be still. When the first king of Israel is being anointed, Samuel is anointing him. And he says, Now therefore, stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did to you and your fathers. The easiest way to be still before God is to remember what he has already done. The easiest way to be still before God is to remember what he has already done. I got popular for funeral services. I'm not sure why. But I get asked a lot. The best healing, the best comfort that comes forth in funeral services is where people begin to open up and share the good memories they have of the one that has passed away. Where they begin to look back and say, this happened and this happened. They remember the laughter. They remember the joy. They remember the satisfaction. They remember the contentment. And next thing you know, they're at peace with the situation that someone has passed on. It's no different in the spiritual realm. We've got to remember what God has already done for us. I tell you that often. Remember what God has done for you. Celebrate it once a year. Remember what God has done for you. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 17, the king has got the letter from the enemy army, and he says, you might as well surrender. We're coming in here. You don't have a chance. You're going to be totally annihilated. And uh, the king, he says, God, what do we do? And God sends a prophet, and the prophet tells them exactly what they're supposed to do. And what they're not supposed to do is fight, but to go out against them. And in our humanity, we'd say, we're to go out against them, but we're not to fight? He says, no. It says, you do not need to fight in this battle. Hallelujah. Some of you are going through some battles, and God's trying to tell you, you do not need to fight in this battle. And then you begin to think, ah, how much can I trust God? Let God be your fortress. Be the trust. Stand still. Know that he is God. He says, position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord is with you. <coughs> says, just be still. I'm going to take care of the situation. All I want you to do is have confidence in me. There are those times when we need to say, God, help me to have confidence in you. How many knows that? Jesus had been up on the mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration. He had been up there with three of his disciples. He became gloriously transformed right before their eyes. He shone brighter than the sun. I think that had to be really, really cool. And all of a sudden, two men that had long since been gone were standing there with them, named Moses and Elijah. And nobody even had to introduce them. They knew exactly who they were right when they appeared. And when the whole presence of God rises and Everything is back as it was. And they come down off the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain, there's a whole commotion going on. I always felt sorry for Peter, James, and John. You have one of those greatest spiritual moments that you'll probably ever have in your lifetime to get to glory. And as you're coming down the mountain, basking in the presence of that spiritual glory of service that you've just been in, all of a sudden there's a commotion going on. And a man runs up to Jesus, and he says, my son is demon-possessed. He throws himself in a fire. He throws himself in the water. He tries to kill himself different times. He says, uh, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything. Can you do anything, Jesus? And Jesus looks at him and says, I can. Can you believe? And the man says, a key phrase, and I want you to remember this. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this. He says, Lord, help my unbelief. I really want to believe. But you know how my doubts creep in. But you're able to help them. You're able to get rid of them. Help my unbelief. Right. I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of times where I've had to say, Lord, my humanity is trying to override.
right the situation, help my unbelief, help my doubts, help get rid of them so I can see the hand of Almighty God. They had been told to be still before that enemy, but to go out and meet them. And so they're going out to meet them and bless their hearts. They're going to go out with worship. Leading the process was those that would sing to the Lord and give praise for the beauty of God's holiness. Hallelujah. Leading them was those that would sing to the Lord and give praise for the beauty of God's holiness. He knows that God likes music. I learned this when I was in college at Penn State studying electrical engineering. Every star, every planet emits a musical tone, usually four or five notes, like every planet, every star, they're all different. But as you listen to them, you find out that they also are in great harmony. Hallelujah. Someday I'm going to be able to hear that. Someday I'm going to stand in the heavenlies with a mighty God and hear all of that. i got to tell you, there are wonders to look forward to that haven't even entered your mind yet. It's just glorious what's out there. God likes the music. Why does God like the music? Because it's a sensation of worship. It's a sensation of worship. It helps us to be still. How many has ever sung your children so they can get calm and go to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear that, Bill said he sings to his pig to get them to go to sleep. <laughs>
lights up in me. Who am I going to meditate on? I am going to meditate on God. What about God am I going to meditate on? What he has already done. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus is asleep in a boat in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. I love to see that. He was indeed 100% human. There are those times when we get totally exhausted. I watched the, some of our folks at the fish fry, and I knew that some of them were totally exhausted. So I told one of us specifically, don't worry about that. I'm going to be here tomorrow. I will take care of that. They listened. They went home. I'm going to tell you the rest of that story. I got here yesterday. I did stuff that I normally do, and I went downstairs to take care of that. And I thought the elves had entered the building because it was all done already. Thank you, Bill, Vito. Thank you much. I really meant to do that. I hope you guys understand that. I wasn't going to let that go. <laughs> Teamwork. Teamwork. Yes, teamwork. Jesus was exhausted. He's asleep. He's asleep in the midst of a terrible storm so bad that the boat is taking on water. They think they're going to sink. They think they're going to drown. And he's a sound asleep on a pillow. So much asleep that in the midst of all that, they wake him up and say, Master, don't you care that we're going to perish out here? Something ever happens here and I'm asleep and it looks like we're all going to die. Please don't wake me up just to tell me we're going to die. <laughs> says, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? This is what it says in verse 39. Then he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Sometimes I need to say, Lord, do you see all the turmoil I'm going through? All the mental anguish I'm going through. All the physical anguish I'm going through. Even spiritual anguish. I'm going to hear you say, peace, be still. Peace, be still. That peace, be still, comes in the holy place. It comes where we're encountering God. There are no exceptions to this. Every person that's encountered God, from Genesis all the way through to Revelations, when they encounter God, all of a sudden, anything they thought they might say went out the window, and it's just like, oh, I'm in your presence. And if they said things that they weren't too sure of, or maybe they were sure at the time, but now at this point when the meeting God is, forget anything that I said, Lord. They're just ready to submit totally to a mighty God. That's where you meet. That's the difference between the holy place and the holies of holies. That's the difference between the holy place and the holies of holies. Does God mean for us to get there? He did. Because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. It was torn that way by God himself so that they would realize it wasn't an act of anybody's human hands. It wasn't an act of somebody just trying to do some vandalism. It was an act of God himself showing that I have opened the way so that anyone, anyone can enter into that holies of holies with an intimate relationship with a mighty God. So we come. We come. In Psalm 84, 4, it said, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Blessed are those that dwell in your house. It's interesting. Oikos, not the yogurt, but that's the word that means translated house from the Greek Old Testament. That's not the word that's used. It uses a whole different word. It says, blessed are those who dwell in your presence. That's a proper translation. You know what the difference is? I can visit Bill's house while he's not home. I can visit Ken's house while he's not home. I can enjoy that front porch. I can visit Rich's house while he's not home. Y'all can visit my house while I'm not home. You don't get the pleasure of my presence. Amen? Amen. But I come here not to say I went to church to be in the presence of Almighty God. Yeah. Yeah. To be in the 
presence of a mighty God. Blessed are those who will dwell in your house. They will still be praising you, Selah. That word Selah is a, means two things. It means, think about it. It also means, repeat this. Remember, all these songs were meant to be sung. I've heard a couple of rabbis sing a couple of them at different ceremonies that I have been to. And I'm thinking, I'm enough trouble just learning things that flow with iambic pentameter and stuff like that. I'd have a rough time with a lot of these songs, especially as you're doing them in the Hebrew. But they're meant to be sung. They're songs. And so it says, blessed are those that dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Repeat that. When might your praises of God quit? Never. They should never, ever quit. But even as I said that, you're already thinking, when a situation gets to this point, I don't feel much like praising God. When my mind gets to this point, I don't feel much like praising God. You all know that you have a spot that you break. But you give it to God, and then you don't. said to you earlier about how the songs move the spirit, how they're worshipful. There's no reason to even that they're gospel songs. When I get to the chorus of this song, and I know that everybody here is going to know this song, you might want to stand and worship because the shoulders that you stand on are the shoulders of Jesus Christ for poor you and me. When I am down and know my soul so weary, when troubles come, my heart burden me, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. to do that, who has desired for us to lean upon him. 
There was a disciple that knew that better than all of the rest. He was John, the beloved. At the Last Supper, he was the one that was leading right against Jesus. It wasn't about any perversion. It was about the fact that he knew he could lean on Jesus and he would be carried through. Even as he's on the Isle of Patmos where he writes the book of Revelations, he knew he could lean on Jesus and that Jesus would carry him through. Lord, increase our faith by your word that we too will learn to lean on Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise be the stillness of this moment. I want you to give worship to Jesus by just saying, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Help my love to abound. Help it to grow. Help it, Lord, to be visible, not only in my spirit, but in my physical mind. That I will know that I indeed love the Lord, my Savior, my God. That it will be more than just words. But that I will know that I have entered into your holy presence. That when I meditate upon my bed, Lord, when I think about you through the course of the day, when I call upon you, Lord God, to help me to be still, Lord God, to help my unbelief, Lord, that I will be confident that you are there, and I will wait. I will wait in the stillness for your touch, your quickening, your direction, Lord, that we will go forth, you lead, and be following, and find great victory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the bulletin, there's a little mistake there. It says, I would like to meet with someone from the after church. Uh, if you'd like to pop up here, uh, we are going to make a change. Sunday school is not going to start on April, first Sunday of April. But we are going to be doing some things a little bit different. So if you'd like to pop up here, I'll give you a brief overview of what's going to happen. But other than that, we're officially dismissed. Make sure you shake somebody's hand before you leave today. God bless you.